Hi folks, welcome to RJ Impact. Today we're going to be talking about the goings-on in week 9 of the Ramesh Sonny Balwani Theranos trial. And as a reminder, Balwani is in court accused of multiple instances of fraud against doctors, patients and investors in connection with his role as COO of Theranos. So proceedings began in court on Tuesday, that's 3rd of May 2022, with a discussion between lawyers and Judge de Villa away from the jury about the admissibility of evidence relating to a doctored Pfizer report. Now, so that you're aware, the report itself featured prominently in the Elizabeth Holmes trial, and it was a study in angiogenesis, uh, which is defined in the dictionary as the physiological process through which new blood vessels from pre-existing vessels form in the early stage of vasculogenesis. The subject matter of the report is actually not too relevant. What is relevant is the fact that it was not a Pfizer report. It was a Theranos report that was doctored to look like a Pfizer report. In particular, logos, addresses, etc. had been added. Now, Elizabeth Holmes in her trial admitted to doing this and the document was shared with potential investors, some of whom went on to invest and both Holmes and Balwani had done this, i.e. send the documents to potential investors. Now, it wasn't the only doctored report that was shared with investors, but I believe it was the only one that Balwani had sent on. Now, you can see the front page of the report here, and in my opinion, it's not very well written. It gushes on in parts, as you might expect, about Theranos. I did a short synopsis of the document and what was doctored, etc., and you can see that video here. So what was the issue? Well, the defence argued simply that Balwani didn't know the report was doctored, and so the fact that he had forwarded it on was essentially irrelevant, and so it shouldn't be brought into evidence. Now, the government argued that while there was no direct evidence, there was enough evidence to infer that Balwani knew it was doctored. Kelly Volkar for the government said at one point about Balwani, he had the motivation to drive revenue for a company that was otherwise running out of money. Anyway, the defence wasn't successful, and so things moved on. And the week's testimonies began with the testimony of Shane Weber. Now, he's a scientist who worked for Pfizer and had been responsible for reviewing the study that was done by Theranos. He also testified in the Holmes trial, and you can see that testimony covered here. His conclusions following that study that he recommended internally to Pfizer was that they shouldn't partner with Theranos. Now, this isn't really a surprise given all that we now know about the Theranos tech. Theranos, in quotes, did not have performance capability, he said. He also noted in his internal memo that Theranos had provided a, in quotes, poorly prepared summary document of their platform, and they unconvincingly argue the case for having accomplished tasks of interest to Pfizer. And about the conclusions themselves, they are not believable. What about the report, he was asked. I did not approve the use of the Pfizer logo on this document, he said. Did you give Theranos authority to provide the report to investors? No, he replied. What about the conclusions in the report that said it demonstrated superior performance? I reached the opposite conclusion, he said. Now on cross-examination, Stephen Cesare Zavorik asked him if he had ever spoken to Balwani. As far as I know, no, he replied. He also said that he had not shared his opinions of the Theranos tech with anyone at Theranos, and he accepted this. Also, apparently there was a meeting with Pfizer executives in or around November 2013, and Weber said that he wasn't aware of that meeting. And things wrapped up with Shane Weber. Next on the stand, we had Nimesh Javari. Nimish was a vice president for the health services segment at Walgreens and helped roll out the Theranos wellness centres. We heard that these were set up in 41 stores and that was accomplished by 2014. Now, there were many more discussions away from the jury about a 2,000 page spreadsheet. Now, that is quite a document. This had been sent to Theranos by Walgreens and contained propriety information relating to around 8,000 Walgreens stores. And the reason for this was that Theranos could identify which stores would be suitable for the wider rollout. And key to this was that it was sent in May 2015. The defence, led by Cooper Smith, was saying that the government was making the point that Theranos was not straight with investors about the nature of Walgreens' relationship and the prospects for expansion. 
Now, the expansion was reflected in documents sent to investors in around autumn of 2014. So the fact that the expansion, as I'll call it spreadsheet, was sent in 2015 does actually lend credibility to the fact that Bolwani was correct in his assertions about expansion at that time. And this does seem a fair point to me. Anyway, all a bit academic because Judge de Villa said that the spreadsheet couldn't be admitted into evidence. Now, apparently Javari had a blood test as a demonstration. Apparently this was done using Theranos Tech and with a finger prick test. Oh dear. Theranos had not run the test on its own tech, but on a third party device. That's not the partnership we signed up for. It's not what we agreed upon, he said. The offering of the service was Theranos own proprietary technology. So if it were done on a non-standard lab machine, that would beg some questions. Some emails were introduced between Theranos and Walgreens about potential deals that would also involve drug companies like Genentech, Abbott and Pfizer. And I think here that the defence are still pushing the fact that there was tangible business activity that would lend credibility to Balwani's forecasts. However, on redirect examination, Javari conceded that he wasn't aware of any contracts or partnerships that came out of those communications. So that was it for the week. And just in case you're wondering, this is a short clip of an Edison machine actually being operated. I hadn't seen this before and apparently was introduced to court, so I thought I'd share it with you. This is all there is and as you can see, it's quite short and not of very good quality. And whilst we're waiting for that to play out, I'll just relay one little factoid that I heard about Elizabeth Holmes. As most of you know, she adopted the persona somewhat of Steve Jobs, her hero, and wore all of those black turtlenecks, etc, etc. Well, apparently in the early 70s or mid-70s, Steve Jobs had a girlfriend. And guess what her name was? Yep, Elizabeth Holmes. Obviously not the same one, but I thought that was a nice little coincidence. Anyway... If you've liked the series so far, please hit that like button, and if you subscribe and hit the notification bell, you won't miss out on any future episodes. Bye for now.